Welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 287 for Monday, March 4th, 2024. This is a podcast all about Minecraft, available across all major podcast platforms, including on YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, consider subscribing wherever you're listening to this. My name is Johnny, but the internet knows me as Pixariffs, and joining me as always is a cinema quality Joel Duggan. Hi, Joel. Speaking of cinema, if you'd like to hear our thoughts about the upcoming Borderlands film, things like Halo on Paramount+, Plus, as well as the Minecraft movie and all the speculation that's happening around that, then you may want to listen to The Render Distance. That's the extended version of the podcast. It is available at patreon.com slash thespawnchunks. And thanks ever so much to all of our patrons for your ongoing support of The Spawn Chunks. It's because of your support we can continue to produce the show every single week. Patrons of the show can enjoy things like access to the Discord, listening to the show live on the Discord as well, Minecraft monthly hangouts where we chat with our Sponge Chunk community about the things that they're building, and quarterly hangouts that happen four times a year where Johnny and I go over the downloads, the data, and the behind the scenes and some of the plans for the show. All of that is accessible via the Patreon page. Once again, that's patreon.com slash the Chunks. We've also really enjoyed watching people working on their bases and sharing screenshots of those in the Discord, but it's time for us to talk about what's new in our bases, which for you, Joel, usually means West Hill. What's new on the Citadel? Well, it's hills, honestly. Cliffs and hills. The uh, thing that I started at the end of last week, which was slowly removing all of the dirt from the West Cliffs, which is this large naturally generated mountain uh, from 116, I should say. So it's not like a new mountain, but it's still a pretty cool looking uh, piece of Minecraft generation. And right now, I believe the biome is windswept hills, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And it's a combination of a lot of stone and dirt in the same way that it just looks like the regular level of four to five dirt blocks across, you know, the Minecraft landscape. And the whole thing has just been extruded. So instead of just being stone there's a lot of dirt columns across the whole thing so i'll include some screenshots of before as well as some screenshots of after and i did not reinvent the wheel i didn't reshape the mountain i didn't do a custom mountain i simply took what minecraft gave me and i removed the dirt and replaced it with stone so it took a while it was not a difficult task but there was a lot of flying around with rockets there was a lot of removing four dirt blocks replacing that with stone and then replacing a snow layer on top of that but to my just delight the transformation of not only just the mountain itself but then the views from within west hill have improved just tenfold because the dirt was sort of clashing with some of the brown roofs on towers some of the uh, other wooden structures and things that were overlapping and so now that there's this sheer gray cliff behind everything the towers stand out more especially if they've got some color to them like my western bell tower has got red terracotta in the top of it so between that and the dark oak roof like it stands out like a sore thumb up against this sheer cliff face but on top of that i've also managed to have this thing feel ominous in in a good way. It's like the, the wonders of nature. It's not scary. It's more like, wow, that is huge. And because of where the Spruce River runs at the very base of this cliff and how West Hill kind of goes right up to the river, there's certain points in West Hill where you can stand at the base of this thing and look up. And it's overwhelming. And it reminds me of when I was hiking in Utah five or six years ago. And granted, those were sandstone, so they were different colors. But you just get up against this rock face that has been like slowly eroded over millions of years. And you're just like, this is just mind numbing it, that this is a almost vertical cliff that's like a mile high. And looking at something like this in Minecraft, it's it's really inspiring that kind of real world feel of like, that. this looks really overwhelming and provides a dramatic backdrop to the town, which it seems like a lot of work to basically do something that's going to be in the background, but I'm really happy with the changes. The only thing that hasn't been finished is the south face of this whole thing, because right now I'm working on the section of the Spruce River that's within the town borders, and that's where this cliff is. And then when I move south of the town border to do a little bit of work down there, I'll work on the south of the cliff as well. But there's just a little bit more dirt to be removed. I did do some reshaping in the south a little bit just because it was clashing with some of the shapes that I had in the towers and has actually springboarded into potentially putting a watchtower up there because logically I've got this curtain wall that goes around the whole town 
And right where the curtain wall meets the mountain, it looks like it might be feasible for someone to climb the mountain and then get access to the town. And so I think it might be worth it to extend the wall a little bit up the side of the mountain and maybe put like a watchtower or something that just kind of came to my mind before we started the show, something similar to like the beacon uh, in in Lord of the Rings at Las Giliath, where Pippin has to climb and, and light it. And it's it's a tower, but it's bu- it's built into the mountain. And I want to do something like that. And, and I think that that could be a cool way to say like, okay, well, this town has been around for a long time, have this older looking tower that's still there, but meant to be more of like the initial kind of beacon for the area. So I'll see what I come up with, but I think it could be really fun. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. It's something that I ran into building my castle in season one of the survival guide, where I thought the coolest place to build it was in between the two mountains in this sort of valley that turned into a plains biome where I decided to build the rest of this town and then everybody told me that was the worst possible place to build a castle because there was no defensible position and you could simply like drop down into the castle from either side there's no point in having a wall and so forth but uh, yeah I, I think it's it's one of those odd symptoms of working with natural terrain in Minecraft you find a cool place to build and then you build something that in retrospect might be completely impractical there but you've also got to remember that mountains and hills and so forth in Minecraft don't really appear to us the way hills and so forth appear in real life in that you know you, you can you can see from a vantage point on top of a hill in real life for potentially miles around you whereas in Minecraft that's dictated by the render distance and likewise you can't see like a a hilltop fort if it's too far away from you so you've really got to work with the perspective that the natural terrain creates and so often that doesn't fit the scale of real world stuff so you couldn't build an entire town on top of this hill or even like a decent sized castle you've just got to work with what you have but i think it's it is striking the difference that in these screenshots between the mountain covered in dirt and the mountain simply made of stone with a, a snowy peak on it i think that looks really cool yeah, I I was surprised at the difference it made. And also, as just a good tip to share with people, you see, I mean, you've done one, players that will make custom mountains. Like there'll be virtually nothing there or a small hill where they really want an actual mountain and they'll go and they'll build one. I don't know how often that happens now that we've got 118 World Gen where people probably are more likely to go look for a mountain that's close to what they want as opposed to building one from scratch. And that's a lot of work. But what I did, taking what Minecraft gave me and just tweaking it by making a simple decision and consciously not letting myself reshape it. If there was anything that felt like it's a little bit odd, I just said, look, I don't have time. If I get it, if I go down that wormhole, then I'm going to be here forever. And this is a backdrop. This is not meant to be like a feature uh, of the town. It's not going to get textured. There's going to be a couple things along the river where I do have some docks where I'm going to want the other side of this to be a little bit more detailed, but I'm not going through and putting like a gradient with tough and cobble and all that stuff. It's just too large. It's just not worth it. And I feel like it's a good tip for for people that want to do some landscaping but are pressed for time or just aren't that good at it yet. Going through and replacing what Minecraft gives you with like a different block, you'd be surprised at, at what you could do. And it could be something as simple as what I did with replacing dirt with stone or maybe something more inventive like you've got some rolling hills in a biome. Like what if you replace it all with blocks from the nether or amethyst and and other different kind of crystalline blocks to make it what looks like a crystal landscape. Like there's all kinds of things that you could do and you don't have to be like a perfect landscaper. You can just kind of take what Minecraft gives you and just start replacing blocks and you'll get used to seeing things that you don't feel work very well and in places you might want to smooth out a little bit, but you could achieve some really cool things. I remember, I think it was a season of Hermitcraft a long time ago. I don't know if it was season two or four or something like that, but Eximovoid removed all the sand from a desert and just left the stone underside of it. And Mm -hmm. the desert was meant to be kind of smooth. And, and that's kind of what the desert was, was designed to be or generated as. But once you remove the sand, it was very uneven. There was a lot of jaggy spikes. It looked really evil. 
and, and devoid of life and stuff. And it was just a very simple way where he didn't have to think about those stone formations. All he had to do was just remove the sand. It was tedious. It took a long time, but the results were really interesting and cool and not something you see a lot of in, in Minecraft. And yeah, the uh, natural sandstone formations are always going to generate a little, you know, off kilter from what you get on the surface anyway. And I think a lot of people are going to have that just by virtue of needing to dig sand from somewhere. So, you know, that can turn into a project. It can be a really interesting one. So what have you been up to in Minecraft this week? A lot of my time has been spent on the Minecraft SOS server because it's new and because people are pretty active on there right now. So it's it's a really fun place to hang out. And I've been trying my best to pop in and be social whilst also trying to dedicate some time to digging a giant hole. Uh, that is currently down to around Y82 from the 104 or 106 or so that it started at. So it's been slow progress, but I've not had access to beacons up until now. That is about to change <laughs> for a couple of reasons. First of which is that the nether is now open. So my hope is to acquire a beacon as soon as humanly possible, really. We're also very close, it turns out, to a nether fortress, so it's nice and easy to go there and acquire some wither skeletons and hopefully get lucky. But the other side of that is that we have events and challenges plans to equip us with more of the fate coins, which are the currency they used to revive us if we die. And the first uh, event, challenge, whatever you want to call it, that we have is a Stardew Valley style collection quest. I don't have a video about this up on my channel yet, but other people have posted about it, so thankfully this is not a spoiler at this point. Uh, the idea is that we're collecting effectively like a double chest style uh, amount of a bunch of different early game resources, and then we're going to split them between everybody who contributes. So we're collecting a ton of logs, a ton of like materials like ores, uh, a bunch of food, and a bunch of fuel, and we're putting it all in these chests, and then once we've filled up the chests, the light goes on to show that we've completed that challenge, and at the end of it, everybody gets a fake coin and a share of the goods. So I thought, how about we try and generate some of the fuel by farming with the skeletons, instead of just using all of the fuel that we're all digging out of the ground, because a lot of us are using that to, you know, smelt some iron to make, you know, hoppers and all of the kind of early game stuff that we're just starting to get fixed in place. So... At the moment, I am in the process of making a Wither Skeleton farm, and an early game one. We haven't got to the end yet, so I can't really farm Wither Roses super effectively without a couple of Wither imprisoning techniques that are usually used in the end dimension. So I've gotten to the point now where we have a, you know, decently spawn-proofed area of the Nether and a platform that's spawning Wither Skeletons inside of a fortress, and... Most of that is going okay. <laughs> Occasionally I get sniped by blazers, but most of the time that's not fatal. And I'm, uh, yeah, getting both coal bones, which are going to be really useful for the moss layers of my digging site, and then hopefully enough with the skeleton skulls to get myself an early game beacon. And then I have to figure out what I'm going to make the beacon base out of, but so far that is going pretty well. It's been a long time since I've done manual wither skeleton farming. We had a long, narrow farm on the Citadel. Well, we still have it. We just don't use it anymore. Where it was so long that you would walk to one end to fight wither skeletons and more would spawn at the other end because you were so far away that they would then have opportunities to spawn. And you basically just walked back and forth and tried to kite them into a, a center zone where you could kill yeah. them over hoppers and like chop at their feet. I think it's a Tango Tech design from ages ago. Yes. And I remember that being tedious to maintain because there wasn't a lot of storage underneath the hoppers. I was bringing all that stuff out of there and I kept on running out of room because of all the coal that you got. And yeah. you were and you were just like, you were focused on getting heads. So you, if you saw coal or sticks or whatever else was dropping, you're just like, meh, whatever, don't care. Like I just, and then later on, you're just like, man, I don't really have a lot of coal. I know I should go by the, the wither skeleton farm. And it's like, wow, there's like eight stacks of coal in here. <laughs> you know, you just, when you're not paying attention, it, it stacks up pretty fast. Yeah. And my goal was to create a small platform for this so that once we have access to wither roses, I can convert it into the multiple platforms, piglin in the middle, all the wither skeletons lured to the center and then an AFK point below it. And that should mean less running back and forth. And the one I built on Empires had, I think, three of the Nether Fortress crossroads in a row. 
and that turned out so productive that I'm hoping to reproduce something on a slightly smaller scale for this server. But that will mean, yeah, coal by the block at that point, like crafting it all down and probably bone blocks coming out of that as well. And then, uh, yeah, eventually just give out or sell wither skeleton skulls or beacons to the rest of the server. So that's that's the, the goal at the moment is to at least get a beacon going on my own project and then see what I can do to help other people. Um, but because of the amount of work that's having to go into that, spawn proofing an area like that in the nether, even with a sizable warped forest as part of the, uh, the area, is still a challenge. And so I've been spending a lot of time doing that, and I've needed to have some small but vital projects going in the survival guide world so that I can keep, you know, making videos over there. And this week I set up some shifting floor flower farms so that I could get a decent supply of dyes now that I have... A bunch of different dyes for all of the different like shulker boxes that I'm categorizing and stuff and I also built a larger bamboo farm than the one I had that was more or less the scale of an early game sugarcane farm you know with observers and pistons and so just so I could mass produce bamboo instead of waiting ages for it I ended up making a, a large field a slime block flying machine to harvest it and a laze to collect it which was a collection mechanism I'd first seen in one of Doc M's recent Hermitcraft videos. Um, and that's a really smart use of a laze, and also a really smart way of getting a laze to drop off uh, all of the material at a central location. Effectively involves having a note block that is ringing to let the laze know to drop items off there, but that's suspended above a water pool with streams feeding into hoppers. So it kind of eliminates the problem of having to put a hopper minecart fused into a note block to have the LAs all drop stuff off there and have it collected automatically because the LAs simply hover up, throw it at the note block in general, and the note block is covered with trapdoors and other things to prevent the LAs from flying up too high and just throwing it on top of the note block and leaving it there. Uh, which is actually a really smart way of setting this up that I hadn't considered when I put together any farms of my own using LAs before. So this is definitely a, uh, a neat design and provides a heck of a lot of bamboo. I wrote that in with uh, a, an exploration of scaffolding because I hadn't really talked about that in the series much so far and I've been using it forever because it's just one of those things that comes naturally to me at this point. And then we also got to go and talk about pandas and I got to bring up the uh, oft unused Easter egg that pandas will also eat any cake that you throw on the ground nearby. Uh, so yeah, we had a bit of fun with the, uh, the pandas and mostly focused on getting uh, some organic stuff growing in Survival Guide this week. I'm really looking forward to getting my own bamboo farm going on the Citadel at scale. We've got some small ones here and there, but I feel like with the upcoming crafter block, as well as things that have already been added into the game, like all the different bamboo wood types, when you need things like chests for hoppers and hopper minecarts, and you need things like trapdoors or other components like that for redstone contraptions that you don't necessarily need it to look good you just need it to function then bamboo becomes a very viable option for all of that especially for fuel that's really what i want it for is to sort out a, a permanent use case for for it in different smelters across the the server and i've been looking at different ways to do it because again like you don't want to do just the you know the same old bamboo farm that everybody else does and alays are are a really interesting way to collect stuff and i love the idea of stacking something on top of the note block kind of taking advantage of the fact that the alays are sort of inaccurate from time to time and yeah. saying like look i just need you to be close enough i'm gonna have a water system underneath here that's gonna collect all the stuff that you drop accurate or not so if i just prevent you from being laser accurate and kind of lean into your inaccuracy then it's actually going to be a, a seamless collection system and i never have to worry about it it's really clever yeah it's very clever and i think the uh the, the only thing you have to remember is to leave an air block above the note block because the allays need to hear the note block chiming which means right. that you you probably have to have your note block sounds turned down while you're around the farm just to stop yourself yeah. from going slightly batty but um, yeah, I think it's really good. And the neat thing about allays is that if they drop stuff in a place that isn't going to be collected by the storage system, then they'll still sense that there are items on the ground there and go over there and pick them up and try again. So even if it's not 100% efficient in terms of the actions that they're doing, you know, they don't always get things right first time, they can have a second try. And it's usually not slowing down the farm any because it has to wait for the bamboo to grow before it harvests a second time. 
And the slime block flying machine is just uh, activated by a couple of daylight detectors right now. So every time the daylight level changes throughout the day, it harvests that field. And it does that multiple times, so whether or not bamboo has really grown doesn't matter. It's always going to have something to knock off and let it start growing again. And so it is not the optimal efficiency, but it's a very easy setup and one that I think is going to last me for quite a while. Well, I think that optimal efficiency is a little bit more of a balance these days between the effort in. And I think there are ways to put minimal to modest effort into something and still get yields that are certainly good enough for a single player world, if not yeah. close to rivaling the peak efficiency. Like, sure, you might get a couple thousand more items, you know, than you would previously with with a higher efficiency farm but like if it requires that much more work or is liable to break or has very specific timing and components and stuff then that might not be the best option for people and something that i like about the la solution as well is now and again you'll get bamboo that will land on top of the stump and just yes so if you had yes. like a hopper minecart underneath this whole bamboo field you're it's kind of difficult because you're going to accept some losses and if that's something that you wanted to mitigate, then using the LAs is something where as long as they're in range, like as long as your bamboo field isn't so large that they don't see the items far away, then anything that lands on the um, the stumps is going to get picked up. Yeah. So once again, can't wait for the crafter to help me with like auto crafting blocks and doing everything else that this wood type can. So yeah, it'll, it'll be uh, an interesting thing once 1.21 rolls around. But in the meantime, we have a snapshot to talk about in this week's newsread. Minecraft Java Edition Snapshot 24W09A was released this past week. And we'll start with the experimental features, which includes some tweaks to the Bogged. The Bogged has an updated texture and model and now drops two mushrooms, either both red or brown or one of each, when they are sheared. The wind charge has had a couple of changes as well, mostly removing randomness from the radius of both breeze and player shot wind charges. And there have been additional changes to the vault texture to even further distinguish them from trial spawners. The main changes in 24W09A include some changes to wolf armor. The wolf armor will now protect the wolf from most damage sources until the armor loses all durability and breaks. I'm not certain about Java Edition, but I believe in the Bedrock Edition changelog it mentioned wolf armor having 64 durability by default. Wolf armor shows signs of increased breakage as durability goes down. Players can repair wolf armor by using armadillo scutes on the wolf while the armor is equipped to the wolf. Wolf armor can also be dyed now in similar fashion to leather armor. The game's UI, or user interface, has been updated with a fresher look and to be more consistent when it comes to the layout of different UI elements, all while retaining the essence and feel of the old screens. The menu background dirt texture has been replaced by a darkened background. The dirt texture has been moved to the built-in programmer art resource pack, so you can enable that if you want the old textures back. Outside the game, the menu panorama is displayed across all screens. In-game, the world will be visible across all screens, but paired with the darkened background, it is also blurred slightly when you open the pause menu. The strength of the blur can be configured in accessibility settings, and in-game screens like containers and books are not affected by these changes, it's just for the menus. Screen elements such as titles and buttons are positioned more consistently across different screens now. The player and world backup screens in Realms have also been updated. Lists now have clearer borders at the top and bottom. And after defeating the Ender Dragon and entering the End Portal, the End Poem and Credits are now displayed with a background based on the animated End Portal effect instead of the dirt background they used to have. In additional changes, control and picking a renamed block, such as a chest in creative mode, will now give a renamed item, so it's easier to duplicate those. Some technical changes in 24W09A, the data pack version is now 33 and resource pack version is now 28. The play sound command can now be used without specifying the player, assuming at S, and without specifying the mixer, assuming the master mixer. In single player, when errors occur during loading or saving of chunks, a warning will be shown in a toast message. Trying to join a single player world with less than 64 megabytes of free disk space will also show a warning screen, and additionally a warning toast will be shown periodically while in game. That's mostly to prevent world corruption due to no more free space being available to store world data. 
Item stack components is one of the largest changes. This all comes under the heading of the data pack version. And to quote the article, we are making some large changes to how item stack specific properties are stored and represented in this snapshot, replacing the current NBT tag with structured components. This change has been made in order to improve performance in cases where the game needs to frequently look up some property of an item, for example, armor trims rendering every frame. Validate item properties at load time, enabling easier identification of invalid data in commands and data packs. This should avoid any silent breakages in commands specifying custom item data for any potential future format changes. This also continues to evolve the game to enable the creation of dynamic content. There's a large section to quote here, so I'll just go through this real quick. It says, We understand that this is a significant breaking change for many data packs and custom maps, which will require significant efforts to upgrade. We do, however, believe that this builds critical foundations for future extensibility. We have taken care to ship these changes all at once, with the hope that this avoids future incremental changes requiring many small updates to packs. The current NBT tag has existed for quite some time, and we are aware that a lot of clever techniques have been developed with this for commands and data packs. Although we've made our best effort to identify these cases, some of these techniques rely on undocumented or undefined behavior with certain tag configurations. We want to ensure that no functionality is lost without a suitable alternative, but due to the undocumented nature of these techniques, we have very likely not caught everything. We hope to address any regressions over the remaining course of this snapshot cycle. And as usual, there are links to report any bugs and any missing features like that on the Minecraft.net feedback site along with the Mojang bug tracker. There is also a lot of additional information included in the changelog article, so if you want to learn more about this change, Check out the link in our show notes. You'll also find all of the fixed bugs for this snapshot there as well. Minecraft Bedrock Edition Preview 1.20.80.20 was published on February 29th. This changelog covers many of the same new features and changes as this week's Java Edition snapshot. However, there is one larger announcement. Hardcore mode is now in testing for Bedrock Edition. Quote, we are excited to say we are working on hardcore mode for Bedrock Edition, and we hope it will be ready for testing sometime in the spring. Hardcore mode is a subcategory of survival where you only get one life and no chance to respawn. Not only that, in hardcore mode, the difficulty is locked on the highest setting. With such high stakes, we want to ensure to get hardcore mode right before releasing it into the retail version of Bedrock Edition. So once it goes into testing, it will stay in preview until we are confident the experience is smooth for both players and creators. You'll be able to help us test hardcore mode by submitting bugs at bugs.mojang.com and giving us feedback on Discord or at feedback.minecraft.net. We are also happy to announce when we are ready, hardcore mode will also be available in realms for both Java and Bedrock. So let's start with that. It's it's about time, I think, is probably uh, the phrase on a lot of Bedrock players' lips because hardcore as a specific subset of Java gameplay has been trending across Java edition like creators for a really long time now. I think, honestly, the event that kicked it off was probably the loss of Filza's five-year hardcore world and that becoming basically the most viewed clip on Twitch. Since then, so many people have gotten into playing a hardcore world, even if they weren't before. It's just been one of those things that in the Java community has been something of a resurgence. And so the fact that the mode doesn't even exist on Bedrock Edition has led to a lot of Bedrock Edition players calling for it. And I think that's why I think spectator mode was implemented for Bedrock Edition a short while ago because that's sort of a stepping stone to hardcore where once you die you can still float around your world locked in spectator mode and just enjoy looking back on everything that you'd achieved instead of just deleting the world when you log out which is how it used to work before spectator was implemented on Java. Um, so hopefully they will have or already have ironed out any bugs that were causing unexpected damage on Bedrock Edition because that's been the main complaint I had seen about Bedrock Edition recently. I know there were some fixes that may or may not have worked in recent Bedrock Edition previews uh, for stuff like that, where the player was taking full damage at times when they shouldn't have been, like pillaring up. Um, so there's there's a few things, obviously, that need ironing out, but that's why they're being cautious, encouraging players to test it and saying, 
you know, we want to make sure we get it right before it's included in the retail version. I think the the words retail version there are also kind of telling in the sense that, yeah, people have paid for this game and we want to make sure we're delivering a, a quality product. So, yeah, really glad that uh, Hardcore Mode is finally coming to Bedrock Edition for the players who've been itching to play that way. And I think that parity across versions is great. It's always good to see those things get closer together. I'm sure that the challenge with bringing Hardcore to Bedrock is the communication. As yeah. anecdotally, Bedrock players, I would say, are probably younger than Java players, just on average. And especially younger, younger people, uh, if they're not quite aware what Hardcore means, if they just think it's more difficult, you know, it's more of a challenge, and it's not clearly communicated that if you die, this world goes away permanently and you can no longer access it. Uh, I mean, you view it and fly around, but you can't actually play in it. I think that could be very frustrating and disappointing for someone who that isn't aware of that. So uh, I even felt a little bit strange reading the quote from the article saying like, well, I know what hardcore mode is, but like, I guess you got to remind yourself, there's probably a lot of people out there that don't know. And despite yeah. the popularity of Let's Plays, and um, I see a lot of creators use it, hardcore mode as a great way to get off and spin off into something new where they want to start a new project or start a new world but they don't want like a permanent thing that they're going to have to maintain for years and years and years as like a single player world, because at, you know, it has a potential finite end, either something that you end on purpose because you've just, you've lived for as long as you've planned, or there's an untimely death and you're just like, well, that was the challenge and I made it so far. And that's how, that's how this series went. And I'll try again another time. And I think there's an interesting, I guess, mentality around Minecraft worlds and that now you're going to see, all the different versions, you know, like there's, there's people that reset their worlds every time a Minecraft updates. There's people that reset their worlds every couple of years when they just feel that they get stale. There's people that don't reset worlds at all. And then there's now going to be people across Bedrock and Java that can reset their worlds either by accident <laughs> or lock them um, on purpose after they've, you know, killed themselves or whatever, after accomplishing whatever goals that they've set themselves. I'm also curious to see in their implementation on Bedrock Edition if you are still able to uh, enable commands and change the game mode of a Bedrock Edition world on Hardcore, because you can do that in survival mode right now. The only thing that prevents you from doing that is a warning that pops up to let you know that this disables achievements for that world. Right. And achievements are, are a global thing. They aren't per world the way they are with advancements on Java Edition. So I am wondering that if uh, players do die and lose their hardcore world potentially there is a way of changing the game mode back to survival and allowing the player to continue in that world but changing that permanently and with the gameplay mode changing that obviously being the same thing it, like it locking you out right. of earning further achievements in that world because of the the way that the achievement ecosystem works so th there's potential for stuff like that which could i think prevent a lot of the problems with younger and less experienced players not understanding what hardcore means in terms of a world's longevity um but i think it's it's going to be a good thing for the game either way because i think a lot of people are going to be familiar enough with hardcore to understand the stakes just from having seen it on their favorite youtubers channels so i think there's uh yeah there's some some good stuff out there and i think uh bedrock maybe has the infrastructure to handle mistakes like that already and once it's implemented and set up the way that they want combining that with add-ons that were announced last week you could end up with a bedrock version on a realm of what you're doing with minecraft sos right yeah yeah potentially i mean there's there's some <laughs> some really exciting prospects for uh for people doing stuff on realms and i think for the most part realms is still the service that a lot of bedrock edition servers have to use or at least it's one of the better examples like it is possible to host a third party server but i think more people opt for realms simply because of stability and availability so the fact that you can have hardcore on realms in general is like a really good prospect and i don't remember if it's still the case but i i'm pretty sure when I signed up and bought Minecraft that I had access to a realm for a month. Like it does, it gives you like, like a free, free month. Yeah. There's a free like trial thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so again, like if you're trying it out and you want to try hardcore, if you're brand new to the game or, or you've bought a, a, another license to play with a family member or whatever, then you'd have access to realms and then access to all of the game modes in realms once, once it's all sorted out. So again, it's, it's all positive news. 
So moving on to the Java edition snapshot, um, I haven't had a look at the UI in full, like I haven't actually opened it up in game and taken a look myself, but having seen some screenshots, it looks pretty clean. Like, I don't know what how you feel as somebody whose career has been in sort of illustration and graphic design and stuff. Um, how do you feel about the new uh, UI changes? Oh, I think it looks great. It, it's, um, it's the kind of thing that's subtle, but brings Minecraft into more of a modern game. It it's the kind of thing that you see in a lot of other RPGs and other games where you're bringing up a menu that overlays the the gameplay. It's usually something like a, a fade or a overlay that's transparent. And I like the fact that they've obviously left an option. So if people are in love with the old dirt background, they can just use the programmer art texture pack and just you, like still have it. Uh, but I, I really think it looks slick. And in a lot of cases, it makes a lot of sense too removing the dirt background from the credits and replacing it with the end portal background again feels cooler to me it feels more like what you've just done and where you are and and it feels like more of a kind of an, an ethereal ending i guess and um from what i've seen and i've seen more than just screenshots i've seen some video reviews where people have like loaded it up and talked about it and it looks fine to me like i it just it feels pretty slick it it, it hasn't really changed much in terms of functionality like it all still works roughly the same after those big changes i think we had back in 118 maybe but i like the way that it looks and if you're in the menu in a single player world or, or any other world really because of it happening in the background like if a player comes up to you to say hi you'll see it if a creeper sneaks up on you in front of you you'll see it so it eliminates that potential you know destruction of uh i'm in my menu trying to change my shaders and i get blown up you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think it's it's overall a really good change and yeah like you say i think it makes it look modern whilst also not changing up too much about the java edition interface to either you know annoy diehard people who don't like change or you know disorient people who are used to finding certain menu options in certain places it hasn't completely rearranged the menu to look like the bedrock edition menu for example it's left all of the buttons fairly similar but just tightened things up a little bit and given it a little polish which i think is is great and the menu splashes and things like that staying there for the uh the sort of opening and the create new world setup i think still looks really nice it keeps the game feeling bright and colorful yes. even when you start digging into those settings and I think that they also were smart to include things like a slider. You know, how much of a of a gradient do you want here for anybody that has visual contrast issues, that kind of thing. Yeah. So if you really want a high, like this is too much noise for me, you can turn that that gradient all the way up or down. I can't remember which direction goes which way, but you can make it more translucent or less translucent, depending on what your visual preference is, which is good. Yeah, I think all of the visual tweaks to the game recently have been developed with accessibility options in mind, which I think is a really, really solid uh, way of doing things. So the big news for survival players, or at least people who enjoy the uh, recent additions to survival gameplay, they have finally taken the plunge and given us dyed wolf armor, which is not quite the armor trim level of customization that I was uh, asking for, but if it works the same as leather armor does, then... That means hundreds of colors are possible with just two dyes alone, which I think is a really positive change for people who wanted a bit more customization to their wolf armor. It makes sense to me. You know, I, I, I felt that it was inevitable and we'll get into this in a minute, but I think one of the reasons that it maybe was not implemented right away is because of the new data pack changes to MBT data and to component systems. Like, I feel like because they knew that that change was coming it was better to wait to implement wolf armor die than it was to do it one way first and then change it again a few weeks later so that that to me makes sense i'm i'm still not the person that's super excited about wolf armor and uh it's interesting to see the changes that they've made to its durability and like it acts more like a shield where it absorbs the damage it then gets damaged it can then get broken or repaired uh, I hope you have a lot of scoots because from what I've seen, when you go to repair Wolf Armor, like it eats up scoots in order to get it back to 100%. So yeah. it, it seems like it, I don't know if it's going to be more expensive than it's worth to maintain, but I guess it depends on how, you know, if you don't want your dogs to die and, or your wolves to die as you're using them for whatever reason. 
um, then that makes sense. And in a way, I know that people have sometimes used tamed wolves for skeleton farms and for other things like that. And if it makes them more durable and less likely to have an error that ruins all the hard work that you put into the farm, then that's that's a good thing too. Um, I don't know whether you could put scoots in a dispenser and repair the armor automatically. That was going to uh, be my next question. Yeah. I kind of wonder if you can do that with iron golems and iron ingots, because that's the other mechanic that works that way, is right-clicking with an iron ingot mm -hmm. on an iron golem to repair it when it's taken damage. Yeah. And I don't believe that's compatible with dispenser functionality, but who knows? There might be room for that in future. I mean, I I like the way that things look. The the It, it looks like it's a, a new thing. It, it's very clear when a when a wolf has dyed armor because it goes all the way up across their forehead like their little the little bit that comes down between their ears gets the dye color as well so mm -hmm. i like the way that they've implemented it and i mean it's just for show but it, it does it does have that i guess reminiscent way that the player looks and changes when you put a helmet on a player mm -hmm. like a, a, it changes enough that i think it's going to be very clear from a distance whether the wolf has got armor on or not. And and I think that that's going to be key for whatever people end up using them for. Depending on the color, it can sort of feel a bit more like wolf pajama than wolf armor, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's Fair. kind of the vibe I'm getting from some of it. But I do think it's it's great that it's customizable. And again, talking about the, the scute thing and, and needing to repair them, I think, honestly, the need to repair them or the desire to repair them to keep one wolf sustained or to clothe multiple wolves if you've got a whole pack running with you, I think that makes the armadillo more valuable because it, it gives you a reason to set up a scoot farm instead of just brushing a couple of armadillos and calling it a day, right? So I feel like, if anything, using wolf armor that way and, and implementing this repair mechanic sort of retroactively adds value to the armadillo scoot. And they did come into the armadillo texture argument by saying we think this is a mob you're going to interact with quite frequently to which the player base went what <laughs> because the only thing we get from it right now is armadillo scutes and there's not really a whole lot else you can do with it but if you're going to be getting those regularly and if you're going to be getting those regularly because wolves feel more useful then i think that that can be a good thing and that's definitely something that brings the armadillo into the current ecosystem a bit more than it was before were there other changes in the snapshot that stood out to you? Well, I mean, the main thing is the item structure changes and, and the way item data is stored, which admittedly is something I know very little about. I don't exactly understand how the new approach to coding item data works, but I've seen people liken it to the flattening in 1.13, where numerical IDs for blocks were replaced with name IDs, and that's since allowed for much easier expansion and storage of block data, it allows you to effectively categorize items. So when you type out an item ID in creative mode for whatever reason or in, in any kind of command, it will say Minecraft stick or Minecraft wooden underscore axe. And that format is kept for mods and stuff as well. So you can have it say Bibliocraft written book. And it allows for easier categorization of modded stuff as well. So this is not only something that internally is going to allow for easier restructuring of how items work and how they add new stuff it's also going to work in the favor of data pack creators mod creators and everybody in between so i'm hoping that that's something that once the community gets used to is going to be a real boon to the way people code their custom content for minecraft and it seems to allow for a lot more than the name would suggest they talk about stack properties in the change log and that seems to cover a lot more than just how many items can fit in a stack so obviously my uh my, my terminology is not quite up to date on exactly what it is this does but i believe sliced lime has a video that's a really good breakdown of how some of this stuff works yeah that was in my notes to recommend as well which was um the news in data pack version 33 uh, which is 24 w09i item components and that's item components are the main thing that that slice lime talks about in that video and like you a lot of it is above my pay grade like i just it doesn't really all sink in but watching the video and trying to at least get the broad strokes from what i can understand the item component system replaces mbt data 
which expands the type of information that can be stored, tags are still sometimes used, but they are used within the item component system, whereas right. tags used to be the only system. And yeah. so instead of having a tag on something, you have these multiple components. So something could have, instead of having a tag, something can now have a tag, a list of tags, or this other component that they've added. And that combined with, like you said, the flattening, which changes things like assigning a die tag would be like white would be one. Now the tag for white is white. <laughs> you know, like So there's some things that make a lot more sense. And I think we'll make it more accessible for people that want to change the game and, and make mods or make data packs and have those data packs be something that maybe you don't maintain, but somebody else decides to maintain in the future, it, it'll make it a little bit more translatable from what I can tell. I'd be happy to be told that I'm I'm wrong or slightly off base, but from what I can gather, it's a more robust long-term system that unfortunately meant that they had to reorganize the existing system. So they didn't necessarily take anything away. It's more that they've, it's like when you're looking for a file on your computer and it used to be in a folder and now it's in a couple of subfolders. You still have all the data. You still have all the information, but any shortcuts that you have on your desktop, you get a change, right? Yeah. Because they're mm -hmm. in, it's in a new location. And I think that's a rough analogy for what this is like. So unfortunately, short-term data pack authors and mod authors might have a fair bit of work to do as they reorganize the way that their mods and data packs are working. However, long-term, it feels like it's going to run better. It's going to allow for changes to happen in a consistent way across the board because i think it's now the same for all items like they it, it's got the same structure so while the item component system might be have different features for each item in the game the way that it's structured is the same across the board so it's consistent in the same way that we want consistency between bedrock and java sometimes it feels like this new component system is consistent across the board and making it easier for people to change the game going forward and judging by the amount of explanation that they've given it and the amount of breakdown that they've given for each of these parameters on the change log alone this must have taken a while like this must be a change that has been in the works from earlier updates than the one we're currently looking at and i think it's kind of commendable that mojang has a taken this approach to communicating it to the community like when it starts getting implemented so that people have a heads up on this and also the fact that they must have been doing this internally and having to keep all of the people who weren't working just on redeveloping this line of code up to speed with that so that any future additions that they make are, you know, adhere to this system instead of the old system, right? So that they've clearly had to undergo a lot of different, like, back-end changes for this to, to work out. And, uh, you know, hopefully it's it's going to be really good for the, the future of the game. For us survival players, of course, this changes very little. But once again, if you're a technical player or somebody who dabbles under the hood and you want to go and check out all of the changelog info on this, that's at minecraft.net. We'll have a link in our show notes to the changelog article as well. And presumably there will be some long-term documentation elsewhere that you'll be able to refer to if you uh, need to know the syntax for some of the new item data storage and all of that stuff. And I'll be looking into this a little bit deeper as it develops for me, because I'm likely going to have to wait a while before I attempt to fix a few broken data packs on the Citadel. I was hoping to do that with, I was going to wait until 1.20.5 came out because it just, it felt like it was coming close, but now I'm not so sure. I feel like I might just update the server to 1.20.4, make whatever small changes I know need to be made, but any kind of sweeping things that I know are broken Unfortunately, it's linked to completing West Hill and that the tables and chairs data pack is not functioning correctly now. And I think I know how to how to fix it by, you know, a lot of work by replacing a lot of the table and chairs manually with a newer version. But the issue there is like, well, am I just going to have to do that yet again when this new item component system is brought into the game? I don't know because I don't know how that particular data pack is is put together. So I'll, I'm going to ask some people that know a lot more than me and, and see what might be the solution coming down the tubes. And as someone that's been somewhat interested in getting into either making their own data pack or maybe even making their own mod at some point or working with someone on it, um, 
I'm I'm looking forward to seeing if this is going to be something that can be rolled forward easier. So one of the hangups I have with making a mod is that if I do that, then every time the game updates, I'm going to have to add yet another thing to my to-do list to update that mod to make sure that it works with a new version of the game. But if this new system makes that easier, then getting into making my own mod or data pack becomes more appealing. Sure. Yeah. Anything that can make that more approachable is going to be a, a good thing in, in my book. Um, but now let's move on into chunk mail. Uh, if you'd like to email the show, the email address is spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. There are obviously a few hot button topics floating around out there. So if you've got some thoughts, send them in. Try to keep them short and sweet because shorter emails are easier for us to read on the show and have a discussion about. Joel, why don't you kick us off with this first one? First email is from McScrewgun, a landscape artist member in our Discord. Subject is XP level ideas. Good morning, Joel and Johnny. In episode 286, Lego My Add-ons, a good deal of the discussion revolved around mending, tool durability, repairing tools, XP, and levels, all stemming from Johnny's self-restriction while digging an interestingly quaint hole. I am too digging a large hole on Infinity Cove, Joel's patron server, and someday we'll perhaps even have a plan for it. It takes me over 10 hours and nearly 11 efficiency 5 unbreaking 3 netherite pickaxes with haste to remove a single Y layer. I would not even consider this dig without mending or without villager trading, librarians specifically. Specifically is the key word here. I need a specific setup on the tool to make this dig even remotely possible. If the enchantments from the enchantment table were not random, if perhaps we could select them specifically, I would not need the same villager trading setup. What do you think of a system where we could essentially buy specific enchantments from the table using levels as opposed to a random roll? For example, it takes 30 levels to get top tier enchantments. Efficiency 5 needs 30 levels, but you could divide the 30 levels up. Efficiency 1 could be 6 levels, Efficiency 2, 12, Efficiency 3, 18 levels, etc. Things like Silk Touch, which only have one level, could cost the full 30 levels, and enchantments with 2 or 3 as the top tier could also scale, albeit by larger increments. Curious to hear what you think? Mixcrewgun did not die, he was just down in a hole for so long that people forgot about him. <laughs> and it sounds like McScrewgun's hole is a lot larger than mine if it takes over 10 hours to remove a single layer. Mine is not quite that bad. And I'm also not using netherite tools because, of course, the difficulty in mending. I worked out that it would take me an additional 10 diamonds every time I wanted to repair a netherite pickaxe just for the cost of the new pickaxe and the upgrade template, not to mention the netherite ingots thrown in there as well. So, yeah, I, I'm fair play to you for doing it with mending. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think... The changes to the enchantment table are a tricky one because I think personally for right now, and this is kind of a devil's advocate argument here, the way the enchanting table currently works is a good experience for first time players because people who are fresh into Minecraft don't know what the optimal enchantments are and are just going to roll with whatever they get. And they're possibly the only people who are ever going to use a Bane of Arthropods sword as a result. But I think the problem with making the enchantment table sort of configurable in any way like that is that a new player is not going to have any idea what's good but the game is still asking them to make a choice and i think that sort of rubs up against the idea of it being mystical and the randomness sort of encouraging players to experiment and try and figure out well what do i get out of this how do i use a tool that has fortune compared to one that has silk touch and going out and interacting with the environment in a tactile way feels like a part of how you learn minecraft and so being given the options when you don't really know what the difference is between efficiency three and four is going to be sort of immaterial to first time players naturally that's going to change as you gain experience with the game which is also something we're going to talk about in the the main discussion this time around but i think giving players control over it from the get-go means less immersion and less experimentation so while I'm all for Minecraft being a good onboarding experience for new players, because I, I obviously I want the game to continue to grow, and I'd be curious to see if there's any public data on like the amount of people playing Minecraft, how many are return players and how many are new players. You know, I don't know at this stage in the game if it's as much as it might have been, 
you know, half the life of the game ago, you know, it's yeah. still growing at the same rate. But I am one of those players that definitely don't like the randomness of the enchantment table, but that's coming from an experienced player's perspective. And so like when I load up a modded world or something, and I have to start from scratch. Granted, the modded worlds always have other cool things to play with, but you generally have to still go through the early enchanted pickaxe, get some silk touch. Like you need the basics. It's still going to be Minecraft, at least in the mods that I play. So I like the idea of offloading XP to get specific enchantments. I, I would also be cool with additional costs, like more lapis or perhaps enchanting templates, similar to armor trim templates found around the world. So I, I think maybe you could keep some of the random for like the low level experience of the enchantment table or add that function to something that exists. So either have new things that you gather to help create a selection for the enchantments or uh, add that capability to existing armor trim templates. So again, giving an additional use to the armor trim instead of just aesthetic uh, and the bragging rights. Like maybe if you had um, a specific armor trim from somewhere in the world, like a jungle, it could be something that you could use to to augment or change the, uh, I guess, likelihood of higher enchants from the enchantment table. I'm not entirely sure how that might work. Um, another thought that I had would be leveling up the enchantment table. So to your point, Johnny, you'd have the basic enchantment table with the bookshelves, which I don't know how easy that is to communicate to players anyway. You know, you're talking about experience for a, an onboarding player. Do, how easy is it to discern that you need to put bookshelves around this thing for it to get up to the higher level enchants? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that, that's I don't absolutely that. fair. Considering that there are outstanding, unspoiled Minecraft players who haven't looked up any information on enchanting and notoriously don't know that the bookshelves and the enchanting table have that interaction. So, yeah, that's that's a fair critique. <laughs> and so... I mean, you could keep that set up, like keep, is, is it 15 bookshelves? And then, you know, you've got your your enchantments going, but maybe that's just the base level and that's where things are random and it operates as designed now. But maybe leveling up the enchantment table through adding more bookshelves or maybe some sort of structure. Like we've had things like the um, conduit, there's beacons in the game. I don't necessarily think that you want to add the amount of stuff that you have to surround a bookshelf with uh or not a bookshelf a an enchantment table with because then it just becomes kind of large and cumbersome and people aren't going to be able to tuck them into cool places in their build but something that i think we've mentioned on the show before when, when chiseled bookshelves first became a thing was are these going to be able to be used with an enchantment table and if you could do something like fill in like chiseled bookshelves with enchanted books if that could then change the enchantment table to a level two, where then you could choose your enchantments, that would still require a decent amount of time investment. You'd have to learn how enchantment works in the first place, all that kind of stuff. And I feel like that might be a way to try and, and hone in these kind of systems. Uh, I hesitate to say that it would need a UI update because I feel like you'd want to have something more Minecrafty than just dumping things into a ui but we've seen some clarity happen with the way that armor trims are now used in the game and how the smithing template a smithing table ui got a new look and how the silhouette of the things that you're supposed to put in there kind of clearly communicated to the player what this is used for and i'm wondering if they did that with the enchantment table if you did something where you'd have to include a couple of different items so similar to a um brewing stand where you put in specific items and you get you don't get a random potion like you get a potion that you've designed it's going to do the thing that you want it to do if they had a similar system with an enchantment table where you put in maybe an armor trim template and you put in the lapis and you put in the xp and then maybe something else i don't know what it could be some other valuable you know then maybe that could then say okay well now that you've got all of these things that are probably a little bit more mid to end game than early game then now you can say okay now you can select which enchantments that you want so i like the idea i just want it to be put behind work for the player i don't think it just needs to change i think it needs to be yes th it's like a game of yes and yes this is the way the enchantment table works now but if you tweak it or augment it or improve it then we can add features to it not replace existing yeah yeah i think that makes sense i think the the chisel bookshelf idea is an appealing one even though it probably means a lot more sort of esoteric knowledge i like the idea yeah. of say 
uh, having a few, say, silk touch books or something like that that you put in the chisel bookshelves around the enchantment table, and that increases the likelihood of getting silk touch in subsequent enchantments. So the more of those you're able to acquire, and it's sort of like, you know, it gives the player a consideration of do I apply this to my tool right away, or do I save up these books so that they can be more like a focus for my enchantment table? I like the idea that then that gives you a way of giving the enchanting table a bias of sorts, you know, so that you, you get Silk Touch more frequently if you are channeling Silk Touch from the books around it. That seems cool, but again, would rely heavily on that being communicated to the player somehow because that same, seems even more esoteric than the system that we already have. I, I'm curious what they could do with enchantments, and I would be surprised if they aren't thinking about it in the aftermath of all of the uh, villager rebalancing stuff and the feedback they've had from that process. So, curious to see how that goes. But Caitlin Z, or perhaps Caitlin Z, depending on where you're from, has a, a, a different suggestion for using XP. The subject of Caitlin's email is using XP to unlock the ancient city portal. Hi, Joel and Picks. was listening to episode 286 where you were talking about how there are fewer uses for large amounts of XP once you have mending, and it made me think of the ancient city. What if the mysterious portal is unlocked by using a large amount of XP donated by the player? I'm not sure how this could work mechanically, but I feel like it fits thematically with skulk blocks collecting and storing up XP. I would especially enjoy it if the experience was similar but reversed to the large XP collection that happens the first time you defeat the Ender Dragon. Imagine interacting with the frame to unlock it, and it begins dragging the XP orbs out of the player. Potentially this could be something that happens if you get close enough to the portal structure, but stops if you move out of range. Would love to hear your thoughts, thanks as always. Caitlin was killed by the Warden after running away from the portal too loudly. This has a Harry Potter Dementor vibe to it. <laughs> Where the XP orbs are just kind of flowing out of you in a mist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it could be kind of alarming. You know, like if you weren't expecting it, you just kind of walk up to this thing like, ooh, that's really cool. What's this? And all of a sudden things just start being drained out of you. <laughs> Especially yeah. if it came with some sort of animation where not necessarily that really awful animation like when you're on magma blocks and you like you, your whole screen ticks to the side I, yeah something that indicates damage but more like a a brain fog or like that freeze animation that happens when you're in uh packed snow like that that kind of stuff could be interesting if it was like a weird almost like a stranger things creeping in around the edge of your view as you have xp life drained from you could be could be interesting it's a neat idea and i i've never thought about using xp for anything outside of like it costs xp on anvils and it it costs xp in the enchantment table but using xp as an external thing in the game it's always flowing to the player in the world when you see it it's never really flowing out unless you die and then it's just like a yard sale yeah but my my mind goes to using it in addition to something like the ancient city for like whatever that if it, if it is a portal then using some of the newer like end game blocks like the lodestone or even the upcoming vault block is a really good example instead of a key like which is what the vault block uses to unlock and give the player a reward maybe if there was a block or a block structure again thinking something along the lines of a conduit where it rewarded the player with a new block a new item that could be crafted into a block something where the amount of XP required could be high. And so you'd have to go up to this thing, dump all the XP, and then you'd get the reward, whatever that happens to be. And in in the case for Caitlin, it's it's you know, assuming that it's a portal in the ancient city, the massive dump of XP that you'd have to do would be what you need to open that portal. Does it open it permanently? Does it open it just for a few seconds? So like every time you want to go you have to use XP to get there. That could be really interesting. Very similar to the enchantment table is every time you want to do a high level enchantment, you have to make sure you're above 30 in order to get the best bang for your buck, so to speak. And that could be really interesting. And if it doesn't have to be player XP, if it could be XP from other sources, then that could be really cool because you could think about how there's those Skulk farms where they, they store up the XP from mobs being dropped on Skulk. Mm -hmm. And if you had like a bunch of mob farms where you're basically sacrificing all these angry mobs that you've been dealing with throughout the game 
and using their energy to then open the portal like that could be kind of a fun setup too it creates some um meta play that could be well okay this is how it functions but what other creative cool ways could players come up with doing this that could make it either look cool be more efficient or or just be a combination of both it sort of goes hand in hand with the theme of the ancient city in general right there are altars around and there is the skulk spread around like as caitlin pointed out like it goes really hand in hand with the notion that skulk is something that absorbs experience and with the portal being made of reinforced deep slate it's quite it's not quite in the same family but evidently there is enough going on around there that it has to do with xp acquisition or xp being absorbed into other materials that it's a logical thing that the game would almost teach you as you approach the portal so i think it's a really solid idea i also love the idea of it being opposite to the xp gain from the ender dragon fight almost as though they are positioned at opposite ends of the game where the ancient city could be sort of a mirror image of the dragon fight and you sacrifice the same amount of levels you get from your first ender dragon kill which if you start at zero is actually about 64 levels funnily enough you get about 10,000 xp maybe 12,000 from the dragon fight and so i think it gets you up into the 64 65 kind of range from from zero um and so yeah i i think the portal requiring something like 50 plus levels to be dragged out of the player and maybe even illuminating the reinforced deep slate in that sort of eerie green glow that xp orbs have i think could be really really fun i also like your idea of there being more than one way of doing it like it doesn't have to come from a player it can come from mobs and whatnot that are left around or 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 sacrificed in front of the portal but my thoughts obviously turn from here to whether this could lead to a more convenient xp storage block for the player because some folks recently have pointed out that the game in a sort of soft uh, soft way punishes players for going above level 30 because that's the max level required for enchanting max level required for repairs is 39 so that's a little bit higher but people don't typically do that much in terms of repairs but then xp levels require more xp to gain at higher numbers so there's no real need to go over 30 levels you should if you're using it optimally get to 30 levels spend that on an enchantment gain three more levels spend that on an enchantment and just keep repeating that just so you're not wasting xp orbs obviously people do it for challenges and whatever else but the idea that you could drain away excess levels or excess experience orbs share them with other players or access them later is a uh, is an idea that's been used in a lot of mods in the past but I think it could be an interesting thing to implement in vanilla and the idea of it being incorporated with the skulk and ancient cities in some way could be a a really interesting way of doing it Uh, so for our main discussion this week we had ideas for xp that lend in a different direction so one solution to uh, mcscrewgun's email about the enchantment system and something that i've been thinking about a little bit uh is the idea of splitting up xp into different levels or categories or using xp like an action rpg might and developing a kind of skill tree and once again there are mods that implement systems like this but i'm wondering if this is the kind of system that would really work well in vanilla minecraft and this mainly came to mind for me when considering the enchanting table and how the experience could evolve from early game to late game because like i said i think the enchantment table works well if it's your first time playing and you're just wondering what is out there but obviously players want to gain experience with the enchantment table and understand what the best uses for them are going to be. And so I wonder if there is a way that we could effectively level up with the enchantment table and develop a skill in enchanting so you become better at it as a world goes on. And the first thought for me there was channeling the XP that we earn into something a little bit more like a an enchanting specialism or something like that and so i wonder if there could be ways in which players could specialize through a skill tree to get the results that they want and as a world goes on just for the sandbox nature of the game maybe the skills could develop to the point where you can get all of them so it's not like you have to specialize the way you would in an rpg where you have to build for a a barbarian class or a wizard class or something like that I, I mean, I like the idea of those trees and RPGs. That's something that's I've I've always liked, and I think that you're right in that. If if that kind of thing was implemented, and you were going through your enchantment tree, 
and you just you went maybe you went like a beeline towards silk touch because like that's something that sounded really cool and you wanted it right away because you wanted to do some building and i like that in your idea it wouldn't then be a permanent decision like you're going to be a silk touch player instead of a protection player or a smite player or something like that i think eventually being able to get them all but again it just it puts them behind uh the time in versus reward out it's the you know which one do you want first they're all going to be something that costs you a bit of a grind to get but at least rather than being the randomness of the enchantment table you could say all right well if i'm a level one silk touch enchanter then i have an increased likelihood that silk touch is going to show up in the enchantment table until you get to the point where uh, it will all, I guess, I guess it can't always show up because if, how does that work? If, if you can eventually unlock the whole tree, what does that do? If you have access to all of those things at the top tier, like, does it still just go back to random again? Yeah, I think, I think the idea here would be that you gain some measure of control over it so that you could right. re-roll for something once you've done enough and not necessarily that you would specialize in a specific enchantment, but that you would gain the ability to actually choose what enchantment you got instead of right. having it be random and and then that that would give you more like a i don't know a drop down list <laughs> or something that you could manipulate yourself it would involve changing the enchantment system up pretty radically i think for the way mm -hmm. it works currently but i think that's the kind of customization that players are hoping for it the question is whether it just makes the game too easy and how much work has to be put in before you do that how many random enchantments do you need to do and is it possible to exploit the system in that way? And and when I was thinking about the other ways a skill tree could split off, honestly, I couldn't find too many that would not just be eminently exploitable just by the nature of the sandbox nature of Minecraft. Like, there aren't many trackable activities involved with something like redstone or building, which would allow you to, to level up in those areas of skill and support those play styles. And anything that is, is stuff like placing specific types of blocks or crafting certain types of components and stuff like that would be very easy to exploit and plus i don't i don't really know a great deal of skills that would really benefit somebody in redstone <laughs> other than just knowing how to do redstone which is a skill you develop on your own so it's it's a it's a flawed idea but one that i still think has legs when it comes to modifying the systems like workstations for example i think enchanting mm. is the most obvious example but if let's say getting better with the smithing table as your you know armor trim collection grows means that the smithing table might occasionally have the uh the ability to not consume an armor trim when you use it which saves you seven diamonds so naturally there is a material reward for the player in developing skills like that or maybe you like you get more leftovers from the crafting process but even that doesn't quite feel right because you expect crafting to be one-to-one -one resources into components out. So I don't know if that feels good to the player to just be left with a, a jumble of stuff afterwards instead of, you know, just crafting 64 comparators and using the expected amount of materials for that. But I, I wonder if there are ways that it feels good to reward the player for leveling up their gameplay in the same way that you get better at blacksmithing over and over again in games like RuneScape, for example. My concern when I first thought about this was the Minecraft player feeling overpowered and it may not feel as balanced because of the sandbox nature of Minecraft where being overpowered in an RPG is what you want. Like you want to have that initial struggle and it's really rewarding when you end up either going through a similar level if it's if it's a roguelike or if you're just moving on through and facing additional enemies that you've seen before and now you're just owning them because you've got these new augmentations that you've put the time in and you've chosen uh, you know, maybe you're more uh, stalwart against ranged attacks. And so those arrows and those archers that were causing you a problem in those in the early levels are now no, no longer a big deal because you can withstand their attack, get up close and, and win. And that feels good in, in an RPG, like an action RPG. But in Minecraft, I don't know how that would fly. But I like the idea of that randomness and working with the profession. So rather than necessarily the interaction with the player in the world, which is where my brain went, but instead, the interactions with the player in those different profession blocks would add features to the profession blocks and uses to those that the player, you know, currently doesn't necessarily have. 
but if it was implemented in a way where it was chance. So you'll see that sometimes in those RPG skill trees where uh, add this many points to your uh, attack. And the reward for doing that is you've got a 15% chance that on the final blow for a, in a fight that you'll increase your hit by 15% or you'll do a special move. Like it's not necessarily making you better or stronger. It's just going to be something cool to see, which in Minecraft could be like using less materials or every now and again from uh, the stone cutter, maybe you get an extra pair of stairs, you know, because you've, you've increased your stone cutter uh, tree. You know, you're more of, you're more of a Mason. And so because you're a level two Mason, you've got a 15% chance to get five stairs instead of four you know, when you're crafting them, that kind of thing could be interesting. Um, I don't know how rewarding people would find that, but I guess, it, I guess that's where you could have that choice where if the, the things that happen within say a barrel, <laughs> you know, to become a better fisher or something like that, then if that doesn't appeal to you, well then don't go down that tree. Like don't use that block. Don't, don't augment those skills. But if you're a, a builder and you really want things like masonry and using the, um, the other blocks, you know, to increase that level, then that could be, that could be really interesting. Another way of developing things which already uses a tree system is through advancements. Like advancements, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. current reward we get for them is XP, and you can set custom advancements that give you physical items as a reward instead of just XP, but the system accounts for that but doesn't use it in the vanilla implementation, in like the default achievements. And so... I sort of wonder if advancements could be retooled into something that feels a bit more like a skill tree. Like once you have all of the nether advancements completed or once you've completed a certain proportion of them, maybe you natively have a bit more fire resistance because you've clearly spent some time in the nether. And that could just be a passive thing that is kind of low key, but in certain situations might save your bacon. And it doesn't require you to sacrifice the protection uh, enchantment on your armor to have fire resistance instead, but maybe you spend a little bit less time on fire after you've come out of lava, and maybe it just gives you that extra edge against, you know, damage sources like that, because at that point the player has become more of a native to the nether. And likewise, I don't know what the same thing could be for the end, but the idea of being able to survive certain situations in the end for a little while, maybe you don't levitate for as much because you're used to the levitation effect from shulker bullets, that kind of thing. I think there are there are subtle ways that these could be worked into gameplay that don't even necessarily have to be part of a skill tree, but they give us options like that. And and I think Minecraft benefits from a lot of these agnostic systems where materials and resources are used for a variety of things. And I think XP levels have always felt like an outlier to me because they're abstract enough that they can work towards intangible things like enchanting, but there aren't quite enough mechanics in the game that use that and so again caitlin's email really appealed to me with the idea of you know gathering levels so that you could ultimately open a portal somewhere or use something else for them but i think right now it feels like xp needs a couple of other uses and so putting it back in reinvesting it in the player's abilities feels like one of those things i don't know whether it's feed the beast or whether it's another mod that had like a quest book and like in order to complete the quest and move on to the next quest, which would ultimately teach you how to use the mod pack, it was like you have to collect and sacrifice, you know, like a stack of cobblestone. And that was your first quest. And that would unlock that tree. And then you'd go through the cobble tree. And throughout the process of, process of, of collecting and crafting these things, you would also learn how the mod was different than, than vanilla Minecraft. And so it would walk you through because you had like this quest book. To, to work your way through it. And I kind of wonder whether having something like, like that with XP, whether it would be Minecraft lore that could be unlocked through a book that you found, or whether it would be um, even something as, you know, we talked about having like a skill tree for the player, but what if something like what we were talking about earlier, the enchantment table had a skill tree. So you could use your XP to dump into the enchantment table and every time you did that along that tree, you would unlock, you know, unbreaking one, two, and three until you had it available. And it w not until you had it all available, it would be permanently unlocked. 
So it wouldn't be there at the get-go, but if you wanted it there long-term, you'd have to dump in a lot of XP. And I don't think it's really that bad in terms of, yes, it's it when you start talking about how often that would require a dump of XP from the player, but given how fast you can make XP farms now and and get that amount of XP in a fairly short amount of time, it wouldn't take that long you know, to, to unlock the table. And then you could also focus on the things that you wanted immediately, the things that would benefit you sooner than later and leave the stuff that you wanted, but were not necessarily high priority until later on when you players often have, you know, end game, you end up having a lot of levels kicking around just because you've gotten better. You've gotten better gear. You're not dying as often, all that kind of stuff. And then you could use that for something, for something else. I, I mean, I, I think there's something to the idea. I think, I, I don't know how it would be implemented across something like peaceful mode or i mean hardcore would be pretty straightforward but i just wonder like if you take out certain components of like the nether in the end like how viable is this across different game modes but then yeah with with, with ideas like being slightly more fire resistant in lava it doesn't necessarily matter so much for peaceful mode players because lava is still a concern but you still heal through a lot of damage and you don't have to worry as much about right. that stuff so there yeah. could be some sort of difficulty agnostic rewards in that way that would still allow the player to yeah like if you've leveled up a smithing table enough then you don't always spend an armor trim if you collect it that kind of thing um and yeah i, I like the idea of there being things like the villager leveling up concept right where we've got additional trades unlocking new ranks for that villager and it going from right. novice all the way through to master and applying that to some of the players abilities as well seems like a really cool idea i think the problem with it is making sure it supports so many different gameplay styles and some of those gameplay styles being very subjective like in the case of building so yeah i i'm, I'm curious about what could be done with a concept like this but i'm not sure if Minecraft is quite right for this environment or if they have to innovate and come up with a system that feels like it makes a little bit more sense, where enchanting doesn't quite meet the mark for the the level of modernity that Minecraft has currently achieved and the amount of people who are still playing but are still thinking, I need some convenience out of enchantment mechanics that's just not applying when I get more powerful later in the game. It sort of feels like the same argument that Cubfan was making a while back about control over light level and control over mob spawning. That seems to have shifted now to stuff like enchanting, where this is still the outlier for when we are all powerful towards the end of the game and we have mastery over so many elements and yet somehow these things are still going to elude us. It does have that power balance thing in there, right? Where you don't want the player to be too quick to get to a high level like you don't want the ability to enchant say something like silk touch or the ability to use xp to augment players ability to go faster than the natural progression of like mining diamonds and like doing those kind of things to the point where it, it, like you don't want to have end game protection enchantments before you even have a full set of armor right like yeah. th there has there'd have to be a, a pacing that that would work um and i i generally like one of the things i really enjoy about rpgs and any kind of you know action rpg is that if it's paced correctly and you are just outpacing the enemies like it's still a challenge you don't feel like a god but you struggle to get through a level you end up with a nice reward right now the thing that comes to my mind is borderlands but you know you get the cool new gun and then the next time you go to play the level it like the first thing out of your brain is like ooh i like this thing because just mm -hmm. it, it just adds a level of fun and a level level of success and uh you better be ready because here i come game you know and i think that that is cool for those games but th those games are always so pve or pvp depending on what game it is where minecraft just doesn't necessarily have that at least not for me i'm not a big pve guy so I don't necessarily need all those augmentations for me in the world. It, it would be more about, um, I guess, player convenience, you know, like being a, a busy adult and wanting to play Minecraft a lot and knowing that the time that you put into the game could be essentially making your future gameplay more efficient from a time perspective would be kind of where I would lean.
I think that's probably where we're going to wrap up our discussion for today, folks. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Spawn Chunks. You can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff that we've talked about today over at thespawnchunks.com. The music for the show is composed by me, and The Spawn Chunks is proud to be a listener-supported podcast. If you're getting some value out of the show, why not consider putting some value back in? You can visit patreon.com slash the spawn chunks to join our community where pledging at any level will get you an invite to our patrons only discord chat. You can listen to the show live when we record it in discord every Monday. We also have our monthly Minecraft audio hangouts where people can share what they've been up to in Minecraft that month. We are currently at 315 patrons, which is down five from last week, but that might be just Patreon processing this week. Special thanks go out to our content engineer patrons, Hunter555, Jumbo Sale, Mind Trip Media, Party Voyager, and Yitz. Thank you all for your support on this episode. Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spawn Chunks on social media. New episodes are available every Monday on all the major podcasting platforms, including YouTube. Be sure to leave a rating and a review wherever you listen. You can email the show at spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. The RSS feed is at the spawnchunks.com and the patron-only RSS feed is on the Patreon page. That's where you can listen to the render distance, the extended version of the podcast. My name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixorifs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixorifs, where the Minecraft Survival Guide is currently in its third season, and new videos are coming out from Minecraft SOS occasionally as well. I stream three days a week on Twitch, where I do behind-the-scenes work for my YouTube series, and I'm the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which you can find through a quick YouTube search. Aside from that, I'm at Pixorifs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything that I'm doing online can be linked through joelduggan.com. That includes the Citadel Cafe, my other podcast about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. You can look for the episode where Johnny and I talk about Avatar The Last Airbender, the live action reimagining on Netflix that's coming out this week. I am Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream Thursday through Sunday, mostly building towards the finale on uh, West Hill, but also Lego on Fridays. That's Those streams are back now, too. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite, and all the dogs have cute sweaters.